So, Bob, I get a text from you the other week, and you tell me that there's a New York Times article that is pissing you off. Yes, I forgot to bring it. I have it right in front of me. Oh, right on. Uh, so, let's go over that and find out what made you so angry. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah, for the listeners out there, Bob just made two fists or two claw, claw hands because he was so frustrated with the article. This article is called Does Therapy Really Work by Susan Dominus. So I'm just going to read yeah. sections. That I have, I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's different excerpts that I pulled. Right on. Over the decades, and especially since the pandemic, the stigma of therapy has faded. It has come to be perceived as a form of important self-care, almost like a gym membership normalized as a routine, healthy commitment, and clearly worth the many hours and sizable amounts of money invested. Just so far, uh, is it pissing you off yet? Gym membership sounds a little, um, well, I'm, I'm not a gym guy, so to me that sounds like a little unimportant way to put it, and I think people should go to therapy if they need to, but not everybody needs to, so I don't, I think that's a bit glib. Yeah, it's a little dismissive. On one hand, I celebrate the fact that people are much more likely to go to therapy. I mean, yeah. you don't live online, really, but you should know that the phrase, I talked with my therapist the other day, is a very frequent phrase that you will hear from influencers, podcasters, YouTubers, actors, famous people. Right on. I would guess most of the famous people that you know of, uh, directors, actors, will talk openly about going to therapy in a healthy, humble manner. And that was not the case when we were younger, correct? Yes. No, it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're old enough and we've been therapists long enough to remember when just saying that we were a therapist or a counselor was a way to shut down a conversation because everyone would be like scared of us right. or they would be skeptical of yeah. even our profession. What are we doing? Or, oh, you just talk to crazy people or something. And it's really different now in yeah. our pocket, in, but mm. on in the West Coast, on the West Coast. But it, it, it is something that I celebrate. On the other hand, the tone, especially knowing where mm. she kind of goes with this, the way she words it, because, you know, she's a New York Times author. She knows how to read. She knows how to write between the lines, if you will. Mm -hmm. And she says, yeah, um, almost like a gym membership, normalized as a routine, healthy commitment, and clearly worth the many hours and sizable amounts of money invested. So that last little bit just emphasizes that people are spending many hours and mm -hmm. sizable amounts of money. It's so critical, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's not untrue. Yeah, but yeah. it's just interesting that you would emphasize that, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in 2021, 42 million adults in the United States sought mental health care of one form or another, up from 27 million in 2002. So just chiming in here. So there are, what, 350 million people in the United States? Yeah, I think so. So that's like one-seventh, yeah. and, and that's like 13%. Huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I guess when I think anecdotally or within my circle, I would say that's low. But when you think about the entire population in the United States, including young people, adults, right. people living in Oklahoma, people living in Los Angeles, uh, that's 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 interesting. Right. In 20, yeah. So in in the span of one year, not having, you know, in 2021, 42 million adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially during the pandemic, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Increasingly, Americans have bought into the idea that therapy is one way they can reliably and significantly better their lives. Okay. okay. Hundreds of clinical trials have now been conducted on various forms of talk therapy. And on the whole, the vast body of research is quite clear. Talk therapy works, which is to say that people who undergo therapy have a higher chance of improving their mental health than those who do not. Uh, so that's good, yeah. good to mention. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm skipping over a lot of the article right. because there are long sections where she raises these questions of efficacy, but I just included that last bit because that was the conclusion. Right. The body of, and, and as I was reading the article, I was, because I knew that you didn't like it. So I was, yeah. I was, I was reading for what it was that was pissing you off. <laughs> and I was wondering if the article 
was going to state that therapy doesn't work because you will hear people will say stuff like that. Right. And I just wanted to highlight that she did acknowledge yeah. you know, that hundreds of clinical trials have now been conducted and talk therapy works. Um, going on here, the body of scholarly work on therapy may show inflated effects. Okay, so now she starts into her mm. thesis mm -hmm. of does therapy work? I mean, she states earlier that yeah. it does, yeah. <laughs> but now. then I guess maybe she's starting to scrutinize the consensus opinion or something mm -hmm. as a journalist that doesn't know anything about the field. Mm -hmm. um, Pim Kuypers wrote in 2021 meta-analysis confirming that therapy was effective in treating depression compared with controls. But he also found that more than half of the patients receiving therapy had little or no benefit hmm. and that only a third entered remission, meaning their symptoms lessened enough that they no longer met the study's criteria for depression. Given that patients were assessed just one to three months after treatment started, Kuypers said he considered these results a good success rate. But he also noted that more effective treatments are clearly needed because so many patients did not meaning, meaningfully benefit, meaning that yeah. many people with depression did not benefit from the therapy that was provided. Falk uh, Leishenring and Christine Steinert surveyed st studies comprising some 650,000 patients, so another meta-analysis, mm -hmm. suffering from a broad range of mental illnesses End quote. After more than half a century of research and millions of invested funds, they wrote, the impact of therapy and medication, for that matter, had on patient symptoms was limited. W what do you think about this? Um, well, you kind of could get in the weeds here about, well, what, what, was, the what was the length of the clinical trial? What, what do they consider limited improvement? But, you know, I just keep thinking about that line from City Slickers. You know that film, City Slickers? It's like... You spend 50 weeks getting knots in your rope and you expect two weeks to kind of untie them. It's not going to happen. And I think about me and I thought, I think, man, I spent the first 20 years of my life getting knots in my rope. I don't really expect them to untie too easy, particularly because of, you know, the way the brain is. And so I, I think this was this, the way this is written, it's too sweeping and condemning and it, it, cuts out some of the nuance. Now, I do have a bias. I believe in therapy. Kind of <laughs> drank the Kool-Aid, if that's a, that's kind of a crap way to put it. But um, so I, I, I think that um, the average reader is not going to see this, um, is not going to see this properly. Yeah. So it bugs me. Yeah, especially given how many people are already skeptical of mental health right. in general. It, at first, I was assuming of course that you would not like this article as a therapist because it demeans your profession your work your life's work yeah. and your clients but it could also demean yourself as a client yeah someone who has invested a lot of time and money right. in the enterprise of therapy and to have this journalist just flippantly say you've been wasting your time yeah it would be upsetting, yeah. That's just a journalist, a journalist who wrote an article for the New York Times Magazine. Right. That's going to get a wide readership. Yeah, yeah. The thing that I'll say about this take is that it's all true that they will find, for example, this highlighted meta-analysis, and it's not cherry-picking. This meta-analysis by Pim Kuypers is representative of a lot of studies. Uh, if anything, it highlights that therapy actually works because you'll do a meta-study on other kinds of therapy or for other kinds of conditions and see lower rates of, mm -hmm. of uh, remission. But... Uh, just reviewing what she writes here, uh, 2021 meta-analysis, treating depression compared to controls. And by controls, they usually are either no treatment at all, or they go to therapy with someone who, what they call supportive therapy, yeah. where the uh, the therapist listens and support and is, uh, you know does a lot of Rogerian listening. And then the treatment uh, group are going through a specific, usually CBT yeah. with, with depression or something. Right. So, uh, he also, see, he found that therapy was effective in treating depression comparing it con compared to controls, mm -hmm. but he also found that more than half of the patients receiving therapy had little to no benefit and that only a third entered remission, meaning that it was long-term. So yeah. of the, 
uh, of the different groups of people. So you could say there's a group of people who went to the treatment. There's a group of people who just went to supportive therapy that arguably could be conducted by a non-clinician, just right. someone who listens for right. an hour a week. Mm-hmm. And then uh, depending on how they uh, manualize the supportive therapy right. on the different uh, studies. And then there's a control group that didn't go to therapy at all. The, the waiting list group, they'll often refer to them as that. And uh, so what this is indicating is that for the treatment group, long-term remission of symptoms, you have about a third. And then of the supportive uh, therapy group, usually maybe say 20%, 15%. I don't know. It, it's usually that that because the supportive therapy is helpful, you know, someone to talk to. Plus, some people just for other factors. Yeah have remission and depression, you know, maybe their life improved or their biology improved, or they just figured things out on themselves. You know, there's a lot of other factors that can lead to someone having a remission and depression. And then the wait list group might be, say, 5% or something, 7% improvement over time. So it's not like the other control groups had zero improvement. Usually there's there's some some. some change. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between the controls and the treatment group, let's say, you know, on the order of 15, 20% difference. So you have a 10% without and you have a a 33% with the treatment group. And you think, okay, well, that's pretty low success rate, pretty low effectiveness, right? And that from the outside, if you don't know what is happening on the inside, then that that sounds pretty depressing, if you will, right? Like, how do you hear it? Michael J. Fox raised $2 billion for Parkinson's. That's really amazing. And we don't, have a, we don't have a cure for Parkinson's. And nobody looks at that and says, well, yeah, we have got, we got these crap treatments. They're not really all that helpful. They just keep at it. And same thing with Jerry Lewis. He used to do that telethon, you know, for muscular dystrophy. Mm, I guess probably billions of dollars too. I don't, really, I don't actually know. Um, and... You know, there's improvements. There's incremental improvements. I mean, this is therapy is what 150 years old, roughly 170 years old, maybe somewhere in there, but but not that old. And um, our understanding of the human psyche is, um, boy, I, I'd kind of like to be alive 100 years from now to see what what it is that we understand. And I think we got a good handle on the just on the fundamental of it. But there's probably a lot more to learn. So and and you know like. People that get cancer go see an oncologist and the cure rates are really not so great, but they keep at it, they keep at it, they keep at it, and we make incremental progress. That's what I don't like about this argu- This uh, article is it's not talking about incremental progress. It's sort of just doing a report card. Well, therapy gets a C. Mm-hmm. Well, come on, man. Mm-hmm. This is stupid. Mm-hmm. I'm impassioned, aren't I? <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. It makes for a good podcast, Bob. Uh, so it makes you angry. Yeah, man, it's just stupid. It's like a poorly written article. Yeah, this article really did piss me off. Mm-hmm. It's it's poorly written and its conclusions are um, faulty. Yeah, and and what really bugs me about it is someone's going to read it and say, ah, oh, yeah, fuck it, therapy. I'm not going to that, you know, because it doesn't really work. And depriving themselves of something. I don't necessarily need my depression to remit entirely in order for me to think that um, my experience in therapy was successful. And people that do therapy like you and I do it, we we. Well, let's see. How do I want to say this? I don't really want to beat my chest. I don't want to be self-aggrandizing. But I'll say this. In my therapy, the thing that's been most helpful is my therapists have loved me. And I don't know how to quantify that. I don't, I don't know how. I wish, I wish someone would write an article about that because to me, that's where the, uh, the money is. And she's just writing about results and talking about gym memberships. It's just kind of shitty and as you said dismissive yeah a, a very similar thing one might say along these lines of this author is that pastoral care or right. end of life care right. never saves someone's life ha, they yeah. all a hundred percent of them die so why are we doing end of life care right why are you uh, talking to the patient as they contemplate their death over the next week right it's a worthless endeavor. It, it's a highlighting of this very reductionistic American version of quote unquote success without right. acknowledging the realities of life. Right. That there's a lot of people who are depressed. There's a lot of reasons to be depressed. Yeah. And to have someone love you while you're depressed 
is apparently valuable enough that people keep spending all this time and all this all this money on right otherwise people wouldn't be doing it right uh, uh, i so mean true. presumably so yeah and it also is painting a picture of therapy as being this really simplistic thing and mm -hmm. the presenting problems are really simplistic mm -hmm. the kinds of things that people come into therapy for you know i there's a, a in fact i'm confident in saying this mm -hmm. i don't know if i've ever said it like this before but i in my entire career i would say less than one percent presented a problem to me meaning that they sat down on my couch and said i would like help with x that involved something in the dsm <laughs> <laughs> More than 99% of my clients sit down on my couch and what they ask me to help them with has nothing to yeah. do with the DSM. Right. Maybe a V code from the DSM-4. Uh, yeah, right. Um, but those are kind of silly things. So so, so then what? Where, yeah. Where are we there? What does that tell us? <laughs> yeah. There's no uh, uh, treatment protocol and there's no, or there's very few randomized controlled trials for the kinds of things people come to come to me for you know sometimes they'll get categorized as like self-actualization or something but it's 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 even different than that i mean um the measurement for the success of therapy that i employ and i'm i'm pretty sure you do as well mm -hmm. is i ask the client is it worth it to you <laughs> is this helpful right has this been a waste of time for you right. or not and if they say that uh, it hasn't been a waste of time and they do find value coming yeah. and it is worth their time and money. Then I say, all right, let's, let's keep going. Yeah. You know? Uh, and if not, then, then if not, and sometimes those are related to specific kinds of things. And sometimes obviously there are ancillary goals like anxiety or PTSD yeah. or borderline or something discernment as to whether or not you should break up or not mm -hmm. infidelity, recovery, lower conflict, you know, there are concrete things that yeah. people, have, but, um, the the I don't know what to say but anyway so let's go on with the article here sure. <laughs> Tallinn has started to wonder so that's a some sort of uh, I'm skipping forward in the article yeah Tallinn has started to wonder if it's time for research to shift away from talk therapy towards more innovative strategies. For depression, there's some evidence that therapy plus psychiatric medications is more effective than therapy or medication alone. Bob, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, right. You know, the gold standard for treatment of OCD is uh, CBT plus meds. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm on Wellbutrin, I, you know, and Wellbutrin saved my bacon about 12 years ago. I was really suffering. I hadn't been depressed like that since I was 25. And so I am pro-med and I still don't like this sentence. It's too innovative. I don't, that doesn't sound very innovative to me at all. That sounds like that's like old school. Yeah. We've fucking known this for 50 years. Yeah. That's not innovative. Yeah. And the medications that we have been using for depression in particular also have not changed for decades. Yeah. Very much. Prozac. Right. I remember when Prozac came out in, let's see, 1991. That's when it started to be used. Really? Okay. Yeah, well, probably probably before, before that, but, but that's when it entered into my zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, and... That was, it's, people still use Prozac. Yes. Yeah. Well, well the class of SSRIs. It, oh, yeah. There's a lot of SSRIs, Prozac right. being one. Yeah. So this notion, it, 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 I just went, there was a podcast called Invisibilia. Oh, yeah, yeah. That I really liked at I first. Liked it, yeah, and then yeah. they started getting into therapy. Uh -huh. And they had this one episode about therapy that was just so stupid mm. that the journalists, the two women, had no idea what they were talking about. And the experts, quote unquote, that they had on their podcast were not knowledgeable about mm. how to talk about therapy. I yeah. mean, they had like a psychoanalyst or something. And, oh, yeah. and, and it was um, not that psychoanalysts are stupid, but no. it, when I see journalists, it's almost like they have this idea and they start with a thesis, right? And then they just get experts to kind of support that, and then they put it out. 
Yeah. Instead of just asking an actual expert, what do you think about this thesis? Right. And the expert would say, well, it's actually way more complicated than that. Right. And let me give you some context. And then and then they can actually figure, you know, yeah. there's another angle there. There's right. a lot of things to write about. I mean, for God's sake, I've been yammering into this microphone as a, <laughs> as a pseudo journalist for 15 years. Yeah. And I, I never ran out of topics to touch on. No, so there's a true. lot of things to get into. Yeah. But you don't have to just make something up and then look for information to support it. Right. And of course, while I'm listening to this podcast and while you're reading this article, you just you know put yourself in the shoes of the masses and know that they have no idea that what they're being fed is a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just this is when I got to the article and I just thought, was this when Bob got upset? Because you know. Tallinn has started, okay, just, just okay. Tallinn, some expert that yeah. she's interviewed, Tallinn has started to wonder if it's time for research to shift away from talk therapy toward more in innovative strategies. And I think, well, yeah, there's a lot of researchers that are looking into all sorts of things. And guess what? None of it fucking works. <laughs> the, you know, transcranial uh, uh, magnetic stimulation. Does it not work? Well, it has some... Uh, uh, seeming effects for things like epilepsy and, oh. and maybe treatment resistant depression for a minority of people. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not up on the research, but it, if we had such technology, you and I would hear about it. Yeah. If all you had to do is hook your brain up to a, a magnet or something or a, or right. a stimulation, yeah. and suddenly everyone's PTSD was gone. You know, it's similar with psychedelics. You hear about these claims about psychedelics, right. and you're just and I'm just like the date that data doesn't show that this is going to be a panacea. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, of course we have. This, this, and I just the hubris of people who, from the outside of an industry, will claim that you know what, maybe psychiatry should look into this. It's like, yes, what do you think they fucking are doing? <laughs> <laughs> For years, there are researchers toiling away yeah. on a underfunded research group to, right. because their mom died of of suicide and right. depression, yeah. and this this researcher has dedicated their entire life and right. that's one of thousands of people and you from the outside yeah. suddenly had an idea that maybe someone should look into it huh. thank you so much that's that's just great and then and then uh you know for for depression uh this is susan the the journalist yeah for depression there's there's some evidence that therapy plus psychiatric medication is more effective than therapy or medication alone there's not just some evidence yeah, there's, there's a, a whole shit ton of evidence yeah. and we all understand that and that's the standard of care <laughs> and the key is talk therapy is involved in that yeah right yeah it doesn't say psychiatric medication is better than talk therapy it says that them together work better than and this is on average by the way there's tons of people who would benefit from one or the other better than if there were sure. both right so it's just on average yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay and she says there's some evidence that is a bug yeah yeah going on david tolan director of the anxiety disorder center at the institute of living in hartford connecticut he believes that researchers should be focusing more attention on drugs that work in novel ways such as one that has been shown to stimulate some the same neurons that are active during cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, again, duh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David Tallin, and thank you, journalist, for pointing out something that we all understand. All right, going on. The most significant difference in patient outcomes, Wampold says, and Wampold actually is a, a known author. Yeah. The significant difference in patient outcomes, what Wampold said, almost always lies in the skills of the therapist rather than the techniques they rely on. Hundreds of studies have shown that the strength of the patient therapist bond, yeah. a patient's sense of safety and alignment with the therapist on how to reach defined goals, is a powerful predictor of how likely that patient is to experience results from therapy. So just chiming in here, we call that the working alliance or the therapeutic alliance, yeah. and it involves three things. It involves a consensus on the goals of therapy, a consensus on the tasks to reach those goals, and a strong bond, strong enough bond between the therapist and the client. Yeah. But what distinguishes the therapist most likely to... But what, but what distinguishes the therapists most likely to forge these bonds is not intuitive. But what distinguishes the therapists 
most what? Wampold says that some of the attributes that would seem most salient, a therapist agreeability, years of training and years of experience, do not correlate at all with effectiveness of, of care. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, it could be. I mean, I've met burned out therapists, so they kind of years of experience and whatever, but um, that none of that talks about, do you love your client? Mm -hmm. Like, do you love your client? The, and as you help me, but you know this better than I do, but I think young green therapists can be very, very effective simply because, well, not simply because, but in part because they are very enthusiastic and are interested in, and they're turned on and they're motivated in uh, working with their, their people. So uh, I, keep, I keep coming back to the same damn thing, which is when you want to raise kids, you got to raise them with love. And if you don't raise them with love, you fuck them up. So if you want to help people who are fucked up, you have to love them. You have to. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, how, it seems like stupid to think anything else because what do humans respond to? They respond to love. Mm. And love isn't just like this, this airy-fairy woo-woo, you know, let's like, um, uh, it, love is a very active thing to do. It requires a great deal of paying attention, paying good attention. I can love my clients now better than I could even five years ago, simply because I have five more years of practice and training and consulting with you and, you know, all the things that I do, um, thinking about, I think about my clients all the time, um, thinking about them, uh, being in my own marriage has taught me a lot about how to love my clients. So, uh, actually what it's done is it's increased empathy because, you know, if you chew the dirt, it's, it's easy to see someone else is chewing the dirt. So, mm. um, yeah. So I wish somebody would talk, I wish she, the, whoever wrote this thing would have talked about that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Beautifully said Thank you. and well emphasized. Thanks. The thing that I'll add is that this passage is fine. I don't think this is a bad thing to put out there. It's complicated, and I worry that the readers, the lay readers, wouldn't really comprehend what's being told to them here. Yeah. But it is true that when we look at our profession as a whole, and the thing that I like to compare this to is if we imagine doing a, an effectiveness study of every physician in the country, <laughs> re, oh, inclu geez. including dentists, right? Oh, okay, right so, so any medical professional, right? imagine saying, how effective is medicine? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what is the goalpost? Right. What are you saying is effective? Because we've already been over that some people are terminally ill right. and are definitely going to die in the next month. Right. So how do we gauge success? And of course, you can have perfectly healthy people come into the hospital and there could be an accident and they can die. Right. So is death the thing that we measure? The right. entirety of medicine? Right. Symptom reduction? What, what, what are the different conditions? Pancreatic cancer is not very, at this point, treatable. So uh, are we saying, are, we're lumping that in with like simple skin cancers that could be prevented right. with proper... Uh, uh, preventative care or sprained ankles right so what are we talking about right. <laughs> therapy uh, involves arguably more variety of clients and more variety of goalposts than what medicine does or at least at, you know to a similar extent yeah right so when we measure effectiveness of therapy what are we talking about yeah but okay fine so uh maybe you measure it by asking clients if it was worth their time or something, or they mm -hmm. improved on whatever it was mm -hmm. that they came in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what they find is that uh, uh, the uh, much more important factor in determining the variance between success and not success in therapy has to do with this working alliance, therapeutic alliance, yeah. and has much less to do with the particular modality of therapy. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And... Uh, what and in, in the article they talked the dodo bird ef uh, effector, meaning that from Alice in Wonderland, there's a everyone wins. I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but uh -huh. it's this parable of no matter who enters the race, everyone wins is essentially, hmm. and that's ridiculous, right? Like mm -hmm. there needs to be someone, and if everyone wins, then maybe no one is winning or right. maybe everyone is thinking they're on a race that doesn't actually exist or something. Yeah. And so uh, it's easy to conclude based on those findings that therapists aren't really doing anything, right? Or they're doing something that is 
very much secondary to what they think they're doing. You know, the, the effectiveness of their therapy has to do with listening and, and a bond and has almost nothing to do with the particular theoretical modality, you know, yeah. whether it be psychoanalysis or CBT or humanistic right. or something. Right. And it, it is worth, uh, you know, contemplating for us. And it certainly should put it into context because a lot of people will, one, be very focused on their modality. And of course, you have infighting where they'll say, you know, your, your model is dumb. Sure. And, but when you look at the, right. at least the aggregate data, um, all models are equally uh, good, if you will. Yeah. But again, this is lumping every single client of every single type into one large pool. Right. If someone comes in with borderline, and you proceed to do 10 weeks of cognitive therapy, it's probably not going to help their borderline very much, probably right? Not. It might help in a way, uh, it might help them with emotional regulation, it might be a first step or something, right. but it's not going to have any long-term remission of symptoms. So, uh, and if someone comes in with a phobia and you proceed to use psychodynamic oriented therapy or attachment based therapy, it, it's not going to do shit for the fucking phobia. No. <laughs> so, uh, treating all clients the same, treating all modalities the same is really silly. Yeah. So, there's that. And the other thing is that there is variance based on the modality. So, it's just less than these other f factors right. the relationship, the working lines. And, uh, the thing that I also will say is that the working alliance is completely within known forms of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> the concept of the working alliance emerged yeah. out of uh, uh, psychodynamic therapy and arguably humanistic therapy. Right. So this idea that all the models, so, you know, this idea of the dichotomy where you have this working alliance thing where you talk about bond and collaboration and then you have all the models of therapy that are separate from that. You know, having a good bond is central to attachment-based therapy, yeah. is central to at least a particular brand of psychodynamic therapy, is absolutely central. Well, I don't know if it's central, but it's definitely a byproduct of humanistic therapy, mm -hmm. Rogers and Gestalt and this right. kind of thing. So that's what always bugs me as well. You could argue that what they're finding, when they're finding that the the model, the particular model doesn't work, but the the relationship matters more than, than the model. Right. What they're discovering is that psychodynamic attachment-based humanistic therapy is the best form of therapy for most clients, not for everyone, but right. for most clients. You know what I mean? I do. Uh, okay, let's take a break. All right, back from the break. So just a little bit more of yeah. the article here. Right. The answer struck me as yet another frustrating unknown in the field. I had perhaps, as a longtime consumer of therapy in search of reassurance, I had perhaps hit my limit with the disputes among the various clinicians and researchers, the caveats and the debates over methodology. Huh. So actually, I thought this was the best written and the most wise section of the article. The, I think it's the final paragraph. Uh -huh. So she's talking about how she's been to therapy and she had talked to a lot of people you know presumably she did a lot more research than she highlighted in her article yeah and she is saying she hit she hit her limit with the disputes the research she's quoting oh no she's re quoting herself the research seems very baggy do you have you have you heard that word before baggy what does that mean i don't know i think she, she means uh like loose or something. Oh, okay. Oh, baggy, right. Um, the research seems very baggy, I said, not bothering to hide my frustration. It's not very satisfying. So I, I think she's talking to an expert in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very satisfying. The research seems very baggy. You know, I think the author was at least proposing to look for an answer as to whether or not her time in therapy was worth it or something. Huh. And she found a lot of different claims, according to the experts. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? What? She had to talk about that with her therapist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could practically hear a smile on the other end of the phone from the expert. Well, thank you, Anderson said. <laughs> um, that's what makes this research so interesting that there's no simple answers, right? A handful, and then um, that's the end of the quote. Right. A handful of well-chosen words, and I felt soothed. So but now she's uh, equating this uh -huh. expert as helping her. Right go through the emotional process of not finding f right. a firm answer in the research that she did. Right. It's an elegant reframe. Right. A handful of well-chosen words by Anderson. And I felt soothed, hmm. even touched, 
by his positivity, which included, with that question mark at the end of his sentence, a hint of inclusiveness. Confronted with my clear annoyance, he had offered me a non-defensive, constructive, and positive response. Chiming in, just, shall I say, humanistic attachment-based psychodynamic kind you of response. You should. Um, we were in this together. The exchange made me think of the best hours I spent in therapy, times when I felt the depth of a therapist caring or experienced the reframing of a particular thought that I hadn't even known could be cast in so different a light. So, Is that the end of the article? Yeah. Oh, right on. What do you think of that ending? Good ending. Um, a little bit, uh, I don't know. I don't like this article. I, it's, she's writing it like she went on some personal journey. I think it was a very limited and short journey, and she's a writer, so she has to write something. Right. So I'm, I'm dissatisfied with the thing um, on the whole. I was listening to a podcast, and they were journalists themselves. I can't remember what podcast it was, but they were talking about how when they pitch a story to their editor, yeah, that their editor would always say, it might have even literally been the New York Times, the editor would always say, where's the conflict or something like that? Like, right. Where's the where's the controversy there there needs to be a fight within the article you can't just say i did this thing and discovered everything's fine right like there has to be some kind of rub and so this article when you read the final paragraph it looks like it's a manufactured rub right it does yeah where she starts out questioning things then she kind of cherry picks experts that highlight the quote-unquote problems in this simplistic almost silly way yeah and then uh, in the end, it concludes that, well, maybe therapy is worth it, but it's not as simple as I wish it were, that kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, like when we were kids, did you ever, did you ever write or see a kid write one of those stories about having this like awful, awful experience? And then the end is, and then I woke up and it turns out it was all a dream. This is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Not, not too impressed with this, ar with this article. Yeah. All right, let's read some emails. Yeah. Uh, anonymous patron from Canada, she says, Fellow Asian therapist here in Canada, I wanted to get your thoughts on how to cope with feelings of incompetence as a therapist. Is this something that ever goes away? I think my insecurities as a therapist were also compounded by being a person of color in a white-dominated field and mm -hmm. not getting the proper guidance and supervision I needed. Um, just chiming in here. Yeah. I have had people come to me and also tell me and email me that their training and their supervision was, was poor and insufficient, which it does not surprise me given my anecdotal experience of, of the field. True supervision and good education and deep, helpful mentorship is rare, apparently. Mm. I feel like it wasn't, at least anecdotally for you and I, when we started out in the 90s, I feel like we had people that would shepherd us. I mean, Paul David, my early mentor, he forced his membership, his mentorship on me. I mean, not forced, but yeah. I was not seeking it. He I, I picked wouldn't, you out of a crowd. Yeah, I wouldn't, not, I wouldn't have thought to ask him, mm -hmm. you know, and he really... Uh, uh, forced the issue and I was happy about it because mm -hmm. I, I thought why me but so much of my early career was based on his help and a lot of my insecurities were also helped by him uh, he he just always believed in me yeah, he just never know. questioned anything and would highlight things that I was doing well right which I'm sure he must have seen some some problems because he didn't observe my work as a therapist that much, but as a professor, he was right there. I, right. I taught under him for a, a year and he would watch me teach and I'm sure it was brutal, but he was always complimentary yeah. and nice <laughs> and, and uh, highlighted what I was doing well. And that was a big deal for me because, uh, you know, in the beginning when I started teaching, I was just like, oh, I remember. I was just like, I'm stupid. I don't oh, know what I'm doing. you would get so, so nervous about teaching a class. So you remember specifically? Oh, I remember being in your apartment over there on Meridian and you were getting ready to go. And you were telling me about how nervous you felt oh, teaching really? a class. And it wasn't the first time you taught it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You weren't there the first time I was teaching because no. I was all by myself in the depths of an anxiety attack. Oh, man. How uh, and I was very close to pulling the plug and saying, Paul, I, I can't. Because yeah. it was an unpaid 
assistant professorship and uh, I didn't have to do it, but yeah. I felt beholden to him. Mm -hmm. You know, ironically, a very similar thing happened about my foray into being a musician was I was, you know, just a regular kid and a, a jock, if anything, in high school. And my girlfriend, oh, who yeah. was a couple years older than me, mm -hmm. she was known for being a performer and a singer and an actress and all this stuff. And uh, I was I was her boyfriend who was this jock, you know, and she wanted me to sing with her in the talent show a duet. Yeah. It was uh, Somewhere Out There, the uh, song from American Tale. Yeah, that's right, American Tale. Yeah. With Linda Rodenstad and... Um, I always forget Jeffrey the other guys. Osborne? Who? No. No? Um, I can't remember his name. But, I mean, it could be that, but I don't think it's him. Uh, yeah. Anyway, point is, is that, you know, somewhere out there beneath the pale moonlight or something. And I thought, a duet? Like, you understand I'm not a singer, right? But she had heard me sing with the radio which i would do sometimes and yeah. she thought that i'd be able to pull it off and i thought nice. that's absurd yeah i mean at the now looking back i'm like well of course i can i can sing because i've i've been singing been my singing. but at the time i, I that was not a, a part of my identity i uh -huh. I'd, I'd literally never sang in front of anyone uh -huh. really in that way you know just and plus i'm terrified of the stage which is a big part of why i was terrified of being a professor right and so I would have under almost any other circumstance declined, even if I wanted, because, you know, there's a part of me, I was like, oh, that'll be kind of fun is to see how it goes. But I did it because of how much I wanted to please her. <laughs> I just wanted her to be happy with me. And so I did it solely on that. And I oh. was so nervous about to go on stage, right. a very similar panic or anxiety attack about, uh, my first time teaching right and i was a hair's width away from just running away mm -hmm. and having her sing the, the duet by herself which she would have done fine she would have improved yeah. this boy girl duet thing right. and and she she would have you know she would have managed she didn't need me is the thing <laughs> and no, she wanted to do it with you she did and um and I did it, and it got me over that hump. And then, right you know, I, I, I was still nervous on stage after oh, yeah. that, but it, it got me over that that hump. And it just makes me wonder at times now in particular if, you know, my Sarah, my high school girlfriend, and Paul, my mentor in my early career, hadn't pushed me and hadn't, and the, if the relationship were different. Like, if you pressured me to do something, I wouldn't do it because I don't, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was it was a particular style of relationship that yeah. i had i mean sarah wasn't abusive but no i was uh you know i was 15 she was like 18 or something and uh -huh. i i just looked up to her and, right so that i and, and with paul like already back then in the 90s he was this god right. in the field and right. um so i just was so desperate to please him so if it hadn't been for the style of relationship that was cultivated if they hadn't pressured me would i be a musician would i be a professor would i be a podcaster because being a podcaster and yeah. grew out of me being a professor right so it, oh, right. It, it's yeah. just it's bizarre to think yeah but there but for the grace right yeah 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 so the person that wrote in is saying that you know in a male in a white person dominated field that they feel like uh, they doubt their own competence. Is mm -hmm. that, am I getting it? Mm -hmm. I, what's been your experience with working in a white-dominated field? Well, I'm half white, so that helps. Mm -hmm. And also, being a guy also yeah. is maybe more of a noticeable difference right. than my colleagues. So that would have an effect. If I were to extend my Asian person of color you know experiences to what it would be like to be full asian it the, you know there's a lot of racism and there's a lot of yeah. stereotyping there's a lot of reductionism people will i got a lot of asian clients referred to me in the beginning which i was happy because i i was i'd take anyone in the beginning right but it felt funny because yeah. i'm fourth generation asian american which is, you know, particular, and the Asians that would be referred to me were Asian nationals, you know, people that were born in Korea and China mainly. Right. And the other thing is like just treating all Asians the same yeah. as if, 
Japanese immigrants are the same as Korean, the same as Chinese, right? It, and creating and or even just uh, treating all Chinese immigrants as the same. I mean, there's this vast difference between different subgroups of China. Uh, you could argue that there are more differences between subgroups in China than there are in all of Europe between the different. It'd be like treating French people and Bulgarians as the exact same sort of people. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So it it's uh, a bit of a silly thing there. So yeah, I mean, there, there'd be stuff like that. Um, there would be a, a kind of uh, assumption that I was more cognitive or intellectual or something, which I guess could be in my favor. You know, I, people have a stereotype, not everyone, of course, yeah, but yeah, I think no. there's a there's a stereotype of what the 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 archetype of a therapist is and the archetype is a white woman middle-aged with very comfortable shoes you know <laughs> uh, and that's the stereotype <laughs> and i'm guessing there's a good number of you listening right now who are middle-aged uh, white women therapists with comfortable shoes. With, there's nothing wrong with that. No, but that, I got all of that except for the woman part. I'm yeah, very comfortable. It's shoes probably a purple shawl in there somewhere. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Again, uh, like I remember I gave my mom a cardigan when she got out of graduate school mm -hmm. for Christmas. Was that it purple? Year. It was um, royal blue. Okay. Yeah. So, I think there's another archetype, which is someone like you, who is an older white, yeah. middle-aged white guy, yeah, with comfortable shoes. Yeah, very and. Uh, uh, Asians don't fit in there. When you mm. think of the archetype of a therapist, you don't think black people, you don't think mm -hmm. Asians, mm -hmm. you don't think Hispanic people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think there was some problem there, right? Yeah. And also just uh, role modeling. It, it, even adults need role models, right? You know, there's a reason why when I would go to certain communities in Seattle and talk to black kids mm -hmm. that a hundred percent of the boys, or I don't know, maybe 99% of the boys, their career plan was to play in the NBA mm -hmm. because for them, right. black guys who were successful and famous and seemed to have it all right. were, that were following the laws <laughs> and weren't a drug dealer were playing in the NBA. Right. And of course, that's not the only place where you can look but it was a compelling yeah. gravitational force for these young boys right and thus school didn't really matter i mean lebron james was drafted i think his 17. after his was he okay i mean he didn't he, he didn't uh, he got drafted he didn't graduate from college and then get drafted no no out of high school like um you know like michael jordan whatever or something right. yeah and so for uh these young men for these teenage boys um uh, to them like that that was one of the only ways to get self-respect or to have some security to right. be attractive to women mm. and to not be a loser you know and so for asians asian men uh where are our role models you right. know where are the the asian men who can be a gravitational force for other asian people right to uh enter the field and to feel like you're not an imposter that that you belong right like if you're uh, i'm guessing a white jewish person in new york you probably feel like you fit in psychoanalysis or therapy in general right, right. because so many white jewish people have come before you right in, in the field so it's just uh there's that kind of thing but but honestly when anonymous patron canada talks about not feeling very competent um and will it ever go away? I would say that that's just kind of normal. I, I don't know. I, I don't know any white person who is comp who feels competent as a as a therapist. Yeah. I think that it it takes a long time. Yeah. And there's just so much to learn. There's I would say for myself, and I had an accelerated process because I was a professor and had to learn this stuff so I could teach it. Yeah. And a supervisor. Uh, so. I had an accelerated, and I was a nerd about it, and then you know, being a podcaster actually really accelerated too. Yeah. And added the fact that I have two master's degrees and a doctorate. Like, there's a lot of time spent, <laughs> and I would say that it probably wasn't until after my doctorate that I actually crested a hill where I was like, yeah, I think it all is galvanized in my head now. I think I feel like it's really coming together for me. Yeah. Like I think about some of the the papers that I wrote 
and this would have been in, uh, you know, so this would have been 2012, like halfway through my doctorate. And uh, that would have been like 15 years into the field. So, so I'm 15 years into the field as a professor and a therapist. Right. And I think about uh, this one paper that I wrote for Phil Cushman, by the way, you've heard people have heard me talk about him. He mm -hmm. died last mm -hmm. year. Uh, and it, it, it was ignorant. I, I wasn't there yet. I didn't really understand the big picture of therapy. And I was also kind of relying on this arrogant sense that I could just make stuff up instead of actually following the greats, you know, uh -huh. and, and then making stuff up. Like you have to understand yeah, yeah. the greats before you can make shit up. You can't just make shit up, right. you know, and, or at least it's not likely to work. Yeah. And so I was just making shit up because I thought, well, can't we all just make shit up? And I didn't understand the bigger picture. And um, so, and that's 15 years in of being a therapist and a professor and a supervisor. What kind of feedback do you get on the paper? Uh, well, Phil, I, I think I might've told you this before. I know I've talked about the podcast. He, he, his primary feedback was I'm unconvinced. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's just awesome. I know. What a great yeah. bit of feedback. Yeah. It, it was, it, it stung, but it was motivating. Yeah. Because he's saying, convince me. Yeah. And uh, I'm not, gonna just check mark i'm not gonna just say good paper interesting premise i'm i'm gonna tell you go back to the drawing board he invited you into a into a dialogue and into growth he invited you yeah that's a good teacher yeah yeah and he was very complimentary he, he phil cushman was you know sort of my later mentor yeah and he he was also very nice I wish and, I had and, met he, him. and he and he what i wish i had met him yeah well, you kind of have. I mean, I, 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 a lot of, if you ever hear me say something smart, it's from Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you look back on that paper, do you look at it like, yeah, I was unconvinced. I'm unconvinced. Well, not only was I unconvincing, but I was arrogant to oh, think that yeah. I, I possibly was being convincing. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, it was, uh, and, and as subsequently, I would, see similar it was a rare profile of student but i would come across future students that were like that too and oh. it, it would particularly tweak me because i know i'm capable of that you know what i mean yeah of course yeah and uh but anyway yeah so this is just anonymous patreon canada so i'll tell you when i reached the point where everything started to integrate i would say it would be around 2015 ish or something Mm -hmm. And I was, and I still had a lot to integrate after that. I mean, I had yet to make my attachment deep dive. I had yet to do my deep dive on in a personal. I had yet to schema. learn uh, about other schema therapy. Yeah, yeah, I had yet to learn schema therapy. But by that point, I had, I had integrated trauma. That was another thing. 2012, I had yet to really understand trauma and really understand how to treat trauma, mm -hmm. even though. I would have proposed that I was an expert and I was probably better than a lot of other people in treating trauma. Sure. But I was 10% down the road of understanding. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of that learning I attribute to a mentor. He was more of a colleague mentor, Bill Heusler. He's a good friend of mine, but he also knows a lot of stuff, but is very humble about it and helped me with that. If people are associated with Antioch, they, they know Bill. He still teaches there. Good guy. In the PsyD program or the? Uh, PsyD, yeah, in the mm. doctor program. He started out as a mental health counselor like yourself yeah. and a police officer, I believe. Wow. And then went back to get his doctorate and became a psychologist and became a professor, that kind of thing. He's, he's a real charming guy. Knows, you know, knows a lot about DBT and trauma and mm -hmm. psychoanalysis and collaborative therapies. He's really big on like, on solution focus and all that. He, he, he's eclectic, you know, he yeah, knows yeah. all this stuff, yeah. Anyway, so I would say that it was around 2015 when I crested the hill, or I thought I did, and maybe later on I'll look back and say I hadn't yet really crossed yeah, the hill, but, but I, I, right. I kind of feel like I did. I feel like I, I, I finally was able to pull a lot of things together and understand the bigger picture while zooming in at times. You know what I mean? Yeah. And mind you, this is 18 years, or I, sorry, 20 years, because I started my master's in 1995. 95. So we have 20 years yep. of being of two master's degrees, mm -hmm. a doctorate, 
you know, years of study, years of writing papers, years of reading, years of teaching, and then I was a prof- and I was a therapist, yeah, uh, mostly full time, but part time at times, but pretty robust part time therapist yeah. for eighteen of those years. Then I was a professor for eighteen of those years. I was a supervisor for you know sixteen of those years, and I was also a podcaster by that point of eight years, which provided me or seven years. It provided me a lot of time to kind of get into some stuff, right? So. That's a fuck ton of effort and time and a lot of people helping me along the way. Yeah, yeah, Good right, mentors. Right. I came I had a lot of shitty professors and a lot of and, and a lot of shitty uh, supervisors. Yeah. Uh, at the very least mediocre and some abusive. Yeah. So I was lucky and also yeah. cultivated tried to cultivate these men- mentorships when they were when they were working well. It was a slog for 20 years and then I felt competent. And then I felt confidence in my competence. Fantastic. But that highlights just how, how much work it takes. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. So the person who wrote in, I'm, I'm thinking similar, cultivate good mentorships. Mm-hmm. Get people who believe in you and who are willing to teach you. I've had several. I'm, I feel very, very lucky to have had the kind of um, learning. But I had to seek it out. Mm-hmm. A, a master's degree is a quick and dirty way to get a license it is a good start but if that's where if that's where training ends i'd be floundering in the dark not even knowing why and probably very unhappy and burned out by you know um miss misattunement miss missing missing too much so i've spent a lot of time getting training after graduate school mm-hmm. and finding people to and you do me. a lot of thinking as well yeah like you don't just leave it at the office no no i don't i i i carry my people around and think about them all the time and you uh, iterate on your learning in session with clients yeah you're not just lazy and sit back and rely on your old no pattern yeah no that's really gratifying very gratifying but i'm as long into this as you i don't have a lot of the experiences you have I had my own path and journey and it took a long long time like i think i studied couple therapy for well, I've been learning and practicing that for 23 years. I'd say I only got pretty good at it, reasonably good at it in the last five. But not for lack of trying and not for lack of shiny moments along the way and a lot, a lot of teaching, a lot of learning, a lot of really good trainers who um, very kindly shepherded me. Mm. So, yeah, I'm very it's similar to you. Is there were people that helped me along the way and I'm forever grateful. Some lovely folk. Yeah, I mean, you're the sort of therapist that at a party, when you're relaxing, you might actually talk with me or someone else about being a therapist, yeah. about what it's like, what you're learning. or yeah. Because there's another type of therapist that doesn't do that, yeah. where they're just like, which is fine, because they just want to yeah. relax. Right. But it helps to accelerate one's competence and confidence to be a nerd about... Yeah. The profession. I love that. Be a nerd about the profession. Right and now. and if there's some people listening that don't feel like they're nerdy in the profession, and they are in the profession, what I'm not talking about some sort of innate drive, but inspiration. Yeah. You know, it, presumably every therapist was inspired by something that touched them deeply. And yeah. if you can tap into that, if you can have the the landscape to play and to be a, motivated. A lot of clinicians are so pigeonholed into a particular career path Mm. or isolated from mentors or they're introverted themselves or they're not, you know, I have the privilege of maybe even being a guy, you know, maybe the fact, because all of my mentors are men Mm -hmm. and maybe they were just looking for another guy to, you know, there was a bit of like Phil Cushman, he was a football. He was really into football. Oh, and uh, and be, and then later became a therapist. It's just like me, you know what I mean. Right. He, he he was known as as a kid as a jock, you know, mm-hmm. in San Diego. Uh, and I uh, we had a similar kind of vibe around that. Around that, yeah. And so I I, I probably had the privilege of of being a guy. I'm tall. I don't know if that makes me stick out a little bit more or Maybe. something. Uh, I I don't know. I've always carried a kind of confidence, even though I'm not particularly confident. 
<laughs> arrogance. I don't know what it is, but maybe that helped. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that everyone has a level playing field when it comes to this, but mm -hmm. uh, encourage people to have... An another factor along these lines is actually before that, I had a stint for some time at a chemical dependency treatment center. So I had already worked with a lot of addiction and had a lot of education around that. But you know, I was the I was the only non chemical dependency treatment professional on staff. There were a lot of dual people who yeah. who were chemical dependency professionals and also therapists and psychologists. Right. But I was the only one that wasn't a chemical dependency professional and got a crash course in their profession and addiction and. Uh, just the ground level of, of what it's like to be with a variety of different presentations of addiction and their families. Mm -hmm. And I would do psychological assessments and I would um, supervise a lot of the folks. And so I learned a lot there too. So there are these, <clears throat> you know, these, these moments, you know, my, my work with DV perpetrators who were mm -hmm. convicted of, of a crime and mm -hmm. had to, they were mandated into my group, you know, it was a similar kind of, experience that you just, you know, you can learn about domestic violence, you can learn about intimate partner oh, violence, yeah. but going through something like that is is a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's learning, huh? Yeah. Uh, but it kind of took me a while to kind of integrate that as well. Mm -hmm. Like I, when I was there, I was absorbing a lot of data that didn't really uh, integrate until maybe even decades later. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, another part of this is last year with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. That was a whole thing too, and and that also helped integrate a lot of things. It actually made me look back not only to my work with perpetrators, but also look back to my uh, my education and experience with forensic psychology, with providing testimony and stuff because I'm trained to do that. Wow. And I didn't want to do that, so I stepped away from that work and that education and that field. But the trial helped me to learn that again mm -hmm. <laughs> to re familiarize myself with the MMPI uh, uh, scales and all the different kinds of anyway so yeah um but for you bob when was it what year would you say uh, or and maybe at a different kind of bell or different kind of learning curve than i did but when would you say you could confidently say i am competent at this job i feel like i don't have to work as hard to just be good at this job two years ago really so yeah. 2021 2021 so what happened i don't know what did it feel like i noticed i would come out of my office at the end of the day and colleen would say how to go and i'd say i was soft and sharp soft towards my people but sharp like mentally sharp uh-huh and i started saying that more and more often and i also noticed that i wouldn't feel so anxious or irritated um a lot of that has to do with you know consulting with you and now um i still get my cage rattled occasionally but um not not much in the last two years hmm. but a pivotal thing for me was um i had i had 150 hours of eft supervision with um my my uh, friend lillian lillian buchanan great therapist down yeah and just to put that in context so a typical stint of supervision you know, might be 50 hours or something. Yeah. 150 hours. So is that 150 weeks? Yeah. So three years of one hour a week. Yeah. And if the supervisor is good and really gets into it, because, you know, there are a yeah. lot of supervisors that'll phone it in. No, she was, she would not phone it in by any stretch. No, she taught so me So how did lot. she help you? She taught me a lot. She taught me a lot about um, softening up. And, um, but, and, but. What, what do you mean by softening up? Mm, yeah, what do I mean? And by the way, can people hire her before I forget? Yeah, she's in Texas now. What's her name? Lillian Buchanan. And she does EFT. EFT supervision, yeah. Yeah, she's one of their... In fact, um, I was one of her supervisees when she was going through that certification training. So, um, so like all supervisors, um, she's part therapist. So, I, you know, I'd have stressors in my marriage and this would be predominant in our meetings from time to time, not often. And she watched me um, do, a, she watched a lot of video of me teaching, uh, me working. And she was unfailingly supportive. She was, I wouldn't say she was ever critical of me, but she wasn't afraid to say, that she didn't think that that was working or that she thought I should consider something else. Did she believe in you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Yeah. 
really, really, she's very kind to me. And I've had a few good supervisors. Her and my old friend David Taylor supervised me for the first six years of my career. Yeah, it, you know, it, I think that is a central feature of good supervision and mentorship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Paul and Phil, and Bill is, I mean, Bill, there's a chance that Bill might even be listening. So I, Hi, Bill. I don't even know if Bill would consider himself. A, I, we're we're colleagues, right. but he didn't. He did mentor. I did. I did. I did look up to him. I, hey, man. Uh, for a time, I but, got that with you. But with Phil and Paul, yeah, it was all one directional. I was always looking up to them. Yeah, <laughs> there was never. I never felt that collegial right. with either one of them. So with them, they believed in me. You yeah. know, not like they said everything I did was great, <laughs> but they believed in me. And yeah. as a supervisor and professor mentor myself, it was about halfway through my career that I discovered that that mattered to people. I, I knew it intuitively as a mentee myself, right. but I'll never forget I, I had a, a student and she was taught, she was toward the end of her master's degree mm-hmm. and she I think she brought up that she, and a person of color, by the way, uh, again, maybe that matters. She was saying, you know, interns are pretty insecure and in a survival mode usually. Yeah. yeah. And they're just, they just hope that they get through it. Right. And they're not usually thinking about bigger goals with their career. And she was. She was, I think, saying that she wanted to be a professor and an author. And you don't usually hear that from interns. Right. And she wasn't arrogant or narcissistic. She, just had a seed of of a question of just like i wonder if i could do that you know I, i'm not there yet but mm-hmm. i wonder if i could one day be a professor and be an author yeah and when she brought this up to me i had you know a beat to kind of think about it and think about what she was saying and think about maybe where this was coming from from her that it wasn't just this pipe dream and i intuited uh, in the moment that this was a big deal to her. And so I said to her, um, yeah, I think you'd be a fantastic professor. Now, do I know that? No, but I did in my mind highlight, because I didn't know her very well. The people that were in my case consultation class w- were typically in that class for 15 months. So, and it, the class is only five, six students. So you get to know each other pretty well. Yeah, And I, I knew enough about her to, to know that there were a lot of strengths about being a professor and an author, that she had a good mind. She had a lot of experiences. She was uh, a very, I, she had a charismatic side to her. Yeah, right she, you know, she could compel an audience, you know, she was driven. I could see a lot of, of strength there and I, and I could see it. Did I know that she could succeed as a professor or an author? No, I didn't know, but, but I, I took a beat to, in my, not just say, but to highlight in my soul, in my heart, what qualities that I saw in her that would align with being a professor and an author. And I didn't even say much. I just said something like, you know, maybe a few sentences that was supportive of that and believed in her. Yeah. It was not hard for me to do. Months later, she comes to me and she's crying and, and she says, I proposed my dream to other people professors other supervisors you were the only one that said what you said wow you know and it makes me cry thinking about it Ugh. and she said it was like i can't I, it, it meant a lot to her yeah. and and she became a professor and an author hey wow good on her <laughs> now of course it has little to do with me it has everything to do with her but i at the time so she tells me this later on and i'm like wow you know i we downplay ourselves as as supervisors. We think, ah, you know, they don't really care what we think about them. It's not that big of a deal, but they do often. Yeah. And to fully understand that, to fully understand that when you're in a position as a supervisor, or even just a colleague, to believe in someone, to say that you're proud of them, to say that, know that they have this, yeah. to see someone's strengths, to see someone's power is one of the best gifts that you can give yeah. uh, someone that's under you and one of the best gifts that you can receive and those gifts that we received, where would we be right. if we didn't have those gifts? Agree. So at some point two years ago, what were all the things that led up to feeling confident? Because it wouldn't, it wouldn't just be EFT training no. and just this supervisor. Well, that was a long journey though. I started learning EFT in 2010, 2010, and I took a one-week class 
came back from that kind of inspired, but didn't want to do the certification stuff. So put that off, but found another class actually that Lillian taught for six months. Um, and then hired her as a supervisor. And then I went and did the certification training, which I thought I'm just going to, you know, finish this out because um, I already know all this stuff. And <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, and so, but I'll just do this because I want to beef up this part of my practice or whatever. Nope. Learned a lot. I had two really good teachers um, in that. It was over four weekends, over um, about nine months. I flew to Toronto and uh, Lori, Lori Brubaker, oh, I love Lori, and Gail Martin, that's my other teacher. So at the end of that, um, but but you're thinking about, you're saying this thing about how um, mentors can be encouraging. Mm. Gail, I, Gail needed a ride to the airport, so I drove her to the airport. Um, I was going there myself. And on the way, she's like, have you considered becoming a supervisor? And this is like just finishing up that certification. So I wouldn't even certify it as an EFT person. I just finished the coursework. And she, I was like, no. She's like, well, yeah, I ought to think about it because you'd probably be all right at it. You probably could do that. And that'd be a good thing. It's just really delightful. It made, made me feel really confident. You didn't become a supervisor. I did not, no. <laughs> but, I think I might be the, able to do the it now. counts. Yeah, yeah. But the thing, the thing about that is is um, my counter-transference of being, oh, I'm responsible. And this thing about faith that you and I talked about the other day. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. S that was so strong back then. I, I, I don't think I could have been all that helpful to anybody. I would have been too brittle. Mm -hmm. But, but I think now I, I could do it. I don't know that it's really my calling, but I could do it. But in any case, um, getting a getting certified in that so credential that I hang on my wall. I, it's the only thing I actually credential wise I have hanging on my wall is my EFT certification, mm. my diplomas and whatever. Though those are just in a closet somewhere. Does your Antioch diploma look like mine? Yeah, yeah. That the small size. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks just like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's in my closet. Well, so uh, I'm guessing that all the hard work that you did prior to that as well, all the clients yeah. you worked with, yeah. the DBT class that you had. Yeah, that was that was something. Other supervisors. Did you have other important mentors prior, like in graduate? I mean, you had, I know you had one supervisor that was important to you. Pam. I don't know. Oh well. I well, had, so who 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 was important to you in the beginning? In the beginning, um, Roger Rosario was the supervisor at the mental health clinic I worked at when I first came here. Was he a mentor? Yeah, and a really good guy, and encouraged me to go to graduate school. Yeah, actually, got I lost my job there. Yeah, because anyways. So uh, let's take a break, and uh, in the middle of this, and when we get back, let's continue this conversation. What do you say, Bob? Yes. All right, we're back from the break. And to be clear, what I mean by mentor for you people out there that are wondering is it's like a parental figure yeah. who cares about, you know, and maybe you only meet up once a, a week for an hour, right. so they're not constantly in your life. Right. But they, and I write about this in my supervision book yeah. and in my exploration of what- Which is a really good book. Oh, thanks. What's it called again? Uh, it's a terrible title. Yeah multi-role clinical supervision. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 yeah. Uh, it's a good book. It's a, yeah. Yeah. It's it not, a, it's not a good title. It, yeah. It, I, I stand by the book. It's, it's yep. concise. Yep. It's research based. Yep. I sprinkle in a lot of my personal experiences. Mm -hmm. You helped me write a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the multi roles, the 19 roles, which is kind of an odd number, but you know, what are you going to do? Hey man, prime, prime number. number. Uh, one of the 19 roles is to be a mentor and yeah. a very important one. Uh, there are other related roles that we've talked about. A good listener is another role that you need to be a teacher, like a true teacher. Because a lot of supervisors, they think they're just signing off on hours and signing your notes and making sure that you're filling out your paperwork. And that is a part of, that's one of the roles of multi-role clinical yeah. supervision. But to, to, now, can every supervisor be a mentor? No, because yeah. it just... You need a good fit. And yeah. Not every supervisor has time or the effort or something. Or maybe you don't even want, like if I somehow needed to be supervised right now, I don't know if I would want someone to put that much effort into me or something. Yeah. Anyway, so it depends. But there are people listening right now, perhaps even anonymous patron in Canada, who have literally never had a mentor 
and they might even be 25 years into the profession, oh. but definitely in the first few years of their profession. That made all the difference. Yeah. And research even shows this, that mentorship is a huge factor in satisfaction and uh, uh, success in yeah. our field. Yeah. So how do you find a mentor? It's hard, you know? At Antioch, at least in the past, maybe they still do, hopefully they still do, they, they have mentor day where actually they'll have mentors show up and then students and other people will also show up and they'll be kind of a get to know each other session. So, so that people can connect with one another and continue mentorship? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So there's that. You can also just reach out to someone. You can yeah. also hire someone as a supervisor. I've done so, that. So it's a win-win. You yeah. know, you, you give them money yep. and they give you mentorship. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, I guess, similar to therapy in that way. Yeah. You can also be mentored by a therapist. You know, therapists can have that vibe with, oh, with sure. you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Even if you're not a clinician, right? You, you can kind of think of your therapist as a mentor. So that's true. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty key. But anyway, so you uh, learned a lot uh, during your, the first decade of being a therapist outside of the mentorship with the fella that you mentioned. Yeah. Were you acquiring data that became integrated later or was it just kind of coasting in a sea of confusion and being overworked? It was more the coasting in the sea. Um, it's, you know, it's such an evolution I can't say it was this or that or that there was some kind of um, plan, thoughtful plan. I sought out training and stuff that I wanted to learn about. Like I made effort to get trained. I mean, you learned a lot about exposure therapy and CBT and stuff in the beginning. So that was helpful. Yeah, I sought that training out. And then... Um, uh, but yeah. in terms of your deeper knowledge that you know now about attachment was not not growing at the time. No, I can't even say in my EFT training that that was much of a an element of emphasis. Though in retrospect, I think it ought to have been. Well, EFT presumably is based on attachment. It, it is. It's based on, but but the talking about that is um, not so overt. Not, yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I find that too. And yeah. that you know, I, I I think that that's a, a failing. That it ought to be more present. Yeah, more overtly present. Yeah. yeah. And I think it might depend on the teacher, yeah. Because certainly Sue Johnson, the figurehead of EFT currently, oh yeah, talks about attachment a lot, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Bowlby. Yeah, that's interesting. So, if you hadn't taken a turn into couple therapy and EFT, you might still be in a sea of confusion and, and, and being overworked and and uninspired and burnt out and not as effective. And not, yeah, not as understanding of what I, what I understand now. Yes, mm -hmm. that very Maybe well even be. not in therapy, the sort of, the type of therapy that you know now you need. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. It'd be a lot different. It would be a lot different. Hmm. Yeah, I'm really lucky. So it's almost like marriage and family therapists are better than counselors. Yeah, of course they are, right? <laughs> <laughs> but their football team sucks. <laughs> it, it's just f funny to think, you know, that you're entrance into marriage and family therapy yeah and because eft is within marriage and family therapy yep. primarily yeah and that uh that's when your eyes are open uh -huh. that's when the scales fell i know it is that's weird and true yeah the guy in her graduate school in 1995 and didn't learn anything about attachment till probably about 2015 mm -hmm. and yet that's the basis of everything I think about when I'm working with my clients mm -hmm. and probably will remain. So I can't imagine that shifting too much because you know, humans are basically mm -hmm. human. Yeah. I think the moral of the story that I'm getting is that there's a few, one is it takes a long time, Yeah, which I don't think I'd ever really fully comprehended until talking this out from myself and hearing yeah, from you. Right. There are multiple paths to true integrated competence and confidence. You have to work at it and you might not know you're on the path because if I, you know, if we would have asked you at the time while you're taking EFT, you'd be like, yeah, you know, it's good. I'm learning. And yeah, I feel like I get it. And you hadn't really fully got it yet. No. And you just never know. It's similar for me. If you would have asked me in 2012, as I'm writing that arrogant paper, I mean, it wasn't terrible. I'm, I'm playing it up. It was a, it was, it's a fine paper. It was paper. just unconvincing. It was unconvincing. Yeah. <laughs> I would have said, well, yeah, I mean, I've been a therapist and professor for, I know. for 15 years. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, and a supervisor, of course, I, 
I know what I'm doing, yeah, right? right? And I, I certainly didn't feel lack of confidence while I was working with my clients, but yeah, I you just don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And um and to be okay with that, you know, uh, to uh-huh. be okay as a pre integrated uh, you know, I, I'm using the word integration because that's the best word mm-hmm. I can use for that moment when it all kind of comes together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the phrases I keep referring, you know, returning to are seeing the bigger picture yeah. and being able to zoom in like on a particular micro moment in therapy yeah. and frame it at, in the way that you understand humans to be and right. yourself in therapy and then be able right. to zoom out and kind of know where is this, where does this fit within the various schools of therapy and research and, right. and the course of therapy and, and what am I missing maybe? And it, mm-hmm. that, that ability to, to see the bigger picture, but also be present in the moment and be able to conceptualize it and, right. and verbalize it yeah. in a way that uh, helps us to galvanize our own thoughts, you know, so we know what we're doing. Right. And uh, so I, there's, it takes a long time. Yes. It involves mentorship and hard work. Yep. You never know where you are on that path and you just have to keep at it. <laughs> you just have to keep learning. You just have to keep trying and it requires effort and you have to be proactive. Yeah. If you, you know, for people who don't know, uh, it's not normal for therapists like Bob to decide to go deep into a particular field or a particular training program uh, um, post graduation. You know, most people with their continuing education requirements, they you know they go to a training here, they're training there. But you made a choice of like, I'm going to really get into this. Yeah. EFT, which was outside of your profession, by the yeah. way, <laughs> yeah. like it was not within your profession it was not. to work with couples and to study EFT. So you actually, in a very you know intentional uh-huh. way, decided to really stretch and, and take a leap of faith that this would be worth your time. If we could do graduate school all over again, I probably would have just done the couple yeah. and family therapy program. Right. Uh, not that that would have. It would have been a beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Just a more suitable beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I dabbled in, well, dabbled. I've studied DBT for 25 years during all that. And yeah. What do you, what do you, had, what do you had my run. Yeah. 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 But, but I wanted to learn that and threw myself into learning it. That was never going to be handed to me. Though I did, I lucked out. I fell into a training at the clinic I worked at and then pursued the shit out of it. Um, after that, mm-hmm. on your free time, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah that, that's the point. Is like, yeah, you had to make a choice. Yeah, no one made you do it. No, you didn't even really have to do it. No, I you didn't. could have coasted. I, I got if I had to. If I had coasted, I'm thinking about how I might have languished without that kind of. I mean, I'm a guy. I'm kind of tall too. I'm white. So who knows what kind of doors that opens for me? But I don't. That's a, that's a, an invisible blessing to me. I, I actually can't see that very well. But I do know that if I want something, I'm going to have to work for it. Like like it will require. And so I'm thinking about the person that wrote in, and I'm hoping that they will seek out whatever it is that they're interested in, that they'll go find someone to teach them. I, I can't read, read books and learn that way. That's not sufficient for me. I need somebody alongside me. Um, I hope that they find mentorship at least mm-hmm. um in the thing that's interesting to them and then just pursue the shit out of it mm-hmm. yeah and this podcast is a part of that yeah you you and i and rebecca as clinicians will in a way in a, a sort of a, a a unidirectional way if you will mm. mentor normalize teach a lot of clinicians out there that's people cool. will i didn't know that this would I always knew that this podcast could help educate, but I didn't know that people would feel held emotionally. That's really cool. And mentored in a way, you know. And people will email in, so there is some back and forth with some people, right? Right. Uh, and we answer emails, so, right. you know, it's, it's at least asynchronous mentorship in a sense. And that's one way. It shouldn't be the only way, obviously, but, you know, that could be, or if it's not this podcast, yeah, you know, there are a lot of other clinicians who are podcasting and on YouTube who can also provide that. They're that, not as that tall, vibe. huh? They're not as tall. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. You know. I don't know how tall. 
<laughs> these other folks are actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, and you know, along those lines, if a part of being a nerd about this field uh -huh. is to listen to podcasts and watch YouTube channels, it, it makes it easy to be a nerd these days compared to when we were younger. Yeah, right. That passively, you just have to subscribe to three of the psychology podcasts that that you vibe with, right? And then you just listen while you're commuting or doing the laundry and stuff just germinates and percolates yeah and, and it, it, you, you absorb it yeah you know? so anyway all right uh the last little bit of the email here mm -hmm. uh anonymous from canada says on a totally different note i know you react to love is blind the reality tv show on netflix have you seen love is blind japan it's so different from the american version it's really I'm really impressed with the participants' ability to communicate maturely and empathize. Wow. End of email. Yeah, I have watched bits of Love is Blind Japan. Uh, Stacy, my wife, watched the entire season uh, seasons, and I would occasionally sit down and watch bits with her. And she would say the same thing. And a lot of other people would email in and say, oh, you got to uh, watch Love is Blind Japan. And I, one, don't have the time, probably, mm. Two, the value that I think I can add to the internet is when I have, uh, when I watch scenes on these reality TV shows and it gives me an opportunity to use it as a jumping off point to talk about clinical stuff. And, right. and the Love is Blind Japan, although it did have seemingly, and I asked Stacy, I was like, should I watch it? And, and Stacy was like, because ah, Stacy knows what sort of shows lend itself to the YouTube channel. And we basically decided that it didn't provide enough issues to actually comment on. There was too much health, you know what I mean? Too much health. Now, a lot of people will say, well, how come you don't comment on health? Uh, and I do sometimes, absolutely. But if that's all I do, it's it's not very compelling viewing, right? Yeah. Like if I just watch yeah. a, a bunch of scenes of people being uh, healthy or non-toxic, then I'm just like, well, that looked good. Nothing to say there. Or uh, let me say what they could have done that would have been bad. Or so I don't know. It, it it's it just it's not very <laughs> it's not very interesting. Um, so, but yeah, I would love to. I, there, there's there's so many shows, including this one, that are on a short list that if and when I get a clone, they will watch those shows. And everyone out there, take care of yourself because you deserve it.